glutenfreesociety.org forward slash masterclass if you're not already registered. It's going on all week, Monday through Friday. It's free to you. It's 14 hours worth of, worth, uh, worth of the most in-depth analysis ever done on gluten, gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and everything that you absolutely need to know. So tonight I wanted to open it up for just a general live Q&A, preferably about questions that you might have about modules one and two, um, which were largely focused on gluten sensitivity. What is gluten sensitivity? And then beyond that, what are the diseases associated or linked to gluten exposure for those of you who have celiac disease or gluten issues? So it's pretty much a free for all for Q&A tonight if it's a gluten related question. Again, don't, don't bring in nine related questions. Also, tell me hello. Where, let me know where you're tuning in from the world and, uh, and say hi. And again, first come, first serve to, for these Q&As. So we'll dive in uh, on these Q&As now. So, okay, let's see here. Is, well, let's see. Can't answer that, Nathaniel. Colloidal silver being safe to nebulize as an antibiotic. You know, you need to talk with your doctor about the safety of that and, and whether or not that's a good choice for you. Um, is there any kind of flour, et cetera, that is actually safe from those with gluten sensitivity issues? Love this question. What kind of flour can you eat if you are um, gluten sensitive? Actually, I'm going to show you a trick. So those of you may, maybe who don't know, uh, my foundation, glutenfreesociety.org, if you have not been there, I'm going to put this up on the screen for you. But one thing that you can do and the search box is you can type in anything you're trying to search on the site. So we're going to just show you how to use this tool, gluten-free flours, because we do have resources on lots of different, um, different things that, um, that you might find. It might help if I, if I spell it for you. But here we go. So we got a couple articles that popped up here. Uh, great gluten-free flours and grain-free flours. So again, just showing you how to use the search feature on the site. You can come in you can pull up this article and you can see here what flours are actually grain-free, gluten-free, almond flour, coconut flour, cassava uh, flour as well. And then also air roots, tiger nut flour, green banana flour, chestnut flour. These are some of your options. Of course, this is not every, absolutely every single grain-free flour, but those are just some of the different options that you can select from. And so that type of thing might be helpful. So if you go visit glutenfreesociety.org, you can type that, you can read about these different flowers, their textures, their nutritional properties, how they're best used and how they're best mixed. Now, one thing I will mention about a lot of these flowers, um, particularly cassava or tapioca, which is, which is a very, very commonly used gluten-free, grain-free flour mix, because it, it has the same chewy, palatable, uh, texture that it can add to foods. So it's very pop, excuse me, very popular. Uh, these can be very uh, low in nutritional density. We'll just put it like that. These, these processed flours are low in B vitamins, they're low in minerals. And so if you make it a habit of using those as staple foods in your diet on a day in, day out basis, you know, malnourishment is something that, that happened in the 1940s as a result of people using processed flours from a wheat, barley, rye, corn rice perspective that's why we have food fortification laws in in the u.s and in other countries because a lot of these processed flours are stripped of their nutritional value when they are processed so you got to be careful with processed flours um, again i don't ne i never recommend that you use them as a primary staple in your diet to try to replace all the bread or all the pasta or all the cereal that you ate you know, before maybe finding out whether or not you had a gluten related issue this is where people get into trouble great question uh, let's see here. Oh, Gene, thank you so much for your kind words. Great on the heart webinar. So then any of those of you who tune in to uh, my good friend Jonathan Landsman's cardiovascular series, I was a featured, uh, featured guest on that program. And if you haven't checked it out, make sure you do. It's a great, great program. Uh, Dolly is asking, I tested negative for HLA-DQ2 and 8, but I stayed in remission from ulcerative colitis since being on no grain, no pain protocol. Love to hear that no grain, no pain hooks you up so wonderfully. Um, how do I know if I'm in fact gluten sensitive? Now, this is the question that I'm going to answer, but I want you to know too, we're talking about this tomorrow on the Glutenology Health Matrix. So again, maybe we can throw that link up there if we haven't already. Um, to register for that matrix, but genetic testing. So HLA, oh, let's move this out of the way here. 
HLA-DQ testing is only one element to, um, to testing for gluten sensitivity. Let's slide this out of our way. What most people measure is HLA-DQ2 or 8. These are two of the markers associated with celiac disease. Celiac disease is the autoimmune disease of the small intestine that damage, again, it's an autoimmune process that damages or flattens the villi in the small intestine. But there are other markers, not just twos and eights. And this is where people get confused because if you have an HLA-DQ1 or an HLA-DQ3, these are what are considered to be non-celiac gluten sensitivity markers. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity markers, and the only way you can tease out whether or not you have a one or a three, because your basic genetic testing companies only measure, only tell you whether or not you have a two or an eight. If you don't have a two or an eight, they just tell you you don't have a gluten issue, and that's wrong. Uh, that's one of the, the mislabeled components of genetic testing in the consumer market. You need to look for the one and the three, and, and to my knowledge, the best way to identify whether you have a one or three just come back over here again, go to gluten. We've got this set up for you as a resource. Gluten-Free Society is set up for you as a resource. And you can see if you go to the page, you can see a link here that says genetic testing. So if you really want to look at that, check out gluten uh, testing genetically. You can, you can get, again, you can get that on Gluten-Free Society. Now, those of you who are attending the master class, uh, tomorrow we're announcing a, the biggest discount on genetic testing that we've ever been able, able to give. This is the, the, the lowest cost. I, would, I had to actually twist the arm of the lab to be able to get us this cost. But, um, so make sure you watch The Matrix. Make sure you watch the Glutenology Masterclass. And, uh, and you can pick up that coupon code when you watch that class and save big time on this DNA testing. So hopefully that helps you out, Dahlia. I'm in... I am and I need your help so bad. I am in the dire, in dire shape and now serious heart problems now too. Well, um, Cherie, you certainly can call uh, Gluten-Free Society and get more information about how we, how we might be able to help you, but um, hopefully you've got a great doctor that you're working with as well. Uh, let's see, another question. Uh, it's not, well, it could be gluten related. Can gluten, uh, can gluten, since we'll just make it gluten related. Can gluten sensitivity cause cracking of the heels? Yes, it can. I've actually seen this in a number of cases where people were, uh, were gluten sensitive and went gluten free, went grain free and the heel cracking went away. But this is also something I've seen linked to, it's a, you know, persistent inflammatory skin damage. So omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies. Omega-3 fats oftentimes are too low in individuals, and this will cause the skin to crack and become inflamed. So omega-3 fats are very important for the skin, especially on the heels. One of the other things I sometimes see associated with that is yeast overgrowth. Yeast overgrowth. Now, when you watch the master class, when you're watching Glutenology in the master class, I go into depth about why yeast overgrowth can create or mimic gluten exposure so that I'm not going to go into depth here. Um, but again, I'm going to keep encouraging those of you who aren't signed up for the master class get signed up because we go into that in great depth. And I want you to learn that and understand that because some, for some people, their diets are so tight, they're so dialed in, but they're still struggling. And there are a number of reasons why. And we cover those in that master class. Okay, let's see here. Is reishi Ganoderma coffee good for us? Uh, Carmela asks. Um, it can be. Um, we actually carry a type of, of coffee um, in our store that has reishi spore, Ganoderma. Um, you can check that out. It's actually, it's one of my favorites. Actually, you can, you can find it from the, uh, in the shop here you go to the shop and then go to food resources, it's under that category. But we've got a couple different coffees that we list in that food and drink resource page um, simply because we want to give people varieties and options. But these are vetted products. So like these are things that we've vetted and we've tested and we know. This particular company, this is a, a Ganoderma Reishi, 
and it's a very, very good product. What I like about it is it's, is it's certified gluten-free, so we know there's no grain in it. There is reishi Ganoderma in it, but I'll, the other thing I like about it is it comes in little sachet packets. It's, it's, in, it's an instant that you can mix to hot water. So this is perfect because so many of you travel in your options for coffee. If you're a coffee drinker, your options are, are horrible. Most, you know, most coffees are contaminated with mold or mycotoxins, um, and many of them are loaded with pesticides. This particular version is organic. It's got reishi but also is gluten-free and you can travel with it. You can carry it with you and all you need to do is add hot water to it. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I love it. I actually keep a couple in my travel bag if, I, uh, if I'm in the mood for a cup of coffee. Uh, let's see, Nicole, I have leaky gut from mold exposure. Can I take vitamin C? Um, I do have a lot of oxalates. I am finishing a detox protocol now. So let, for clarity's sake, um, you know, if you have leaky gut from mold exposure, first rule in that scenario is, is deal with the mold. Um, dealing with the mold is critical. Mold actually, mold exposure, chronicity of mold exposure can actually contribute to elevations and oxalates. The problem with vitamin C in higher doses, if you also have high oxalate, is vitamin C can contribute to the, uh, to the added burden of even more. Um, it's not that vitamin C causes high oxalates per se, it's just that if you already have them, it may be something you wanna be cautious about taking large quantities of until you deal with the mold issue and get the oxalate under better control. And we have a really, we did a great show on oxalates that I would encourage you to go back and check out our archives. You can do that through Gluten-Free Society. Again, if you use the search engine on the top, you just top in the term oxalate in that search box and you'll be able to pull that show up on, on the website directly and, and be able to go back and watch it. And we also have some resources for you to read about as it relates to oxalate as well. Uh, Angeline's asking, what's the difference between the, the most popular package for the glutenology matrix if you wanted to purchase that package? The difference between the most popular version in the VIP access is, is actually the VIP access in the popular version, the, the, the most popular version um, are identical, except for we're encouraging people to buy it at a lower price to get 25 hours of bonus videos of my nutritional library. I have a nutritional masterclass library of about 25 hours worth of video content, and that comes with that most popular choice. We're just incentivizing people to get even more knowledge and more information and pay a lower price. So that's really the difference is you pay less but get 25 hours more worth of content to peruse through, watch, learn from, and hopefully benefit your health and your family's health from. So we're just trying to, to give you more while paying less. Uh, let's see here. Uh, scroll down on that right side for me. Okay, here we go. Uh, Kimberly, hi from Georgia. I've learned so much from you over the past two years. Last month, my colonoscopy showed no active Crohn's. Love to hear that. It was my fourth colonoscopy in 10 years and the first one to show I'm in remission. Kimberly, that is so wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. That just makes my day. You know here our mission is to help save 100 million lives and, and it just makes me bubble up inside to know that we may have played a role in helping you achieve remission of a very, very dangerous and life-threatening inflammatory bowel disease. Um, Carmela wants to know, what's a good product for healing the lining of the gut? Simple. The simple answer is diet change. Get, it, get, get into the masterclass, watch, or rather read No Grain, No Pain, because it's not a simple one answer, one size fits all answer. Although I will, I will mention there are a couple of things that I formulated that I find with my experience have been very helpful to help people support their gut recovery. One is L-glutamine. Uh, L-glutamine uh, by itself, this is a, a, in what's known as a conditionally essential amino acid that supports the r r turnover rate of, of enterocytes or cells of the small intestine. It's their primary source of fuel. A lot of people develop um, problems in the gut and they burn through all of their glutamine. So sometimes glutamine can be very supportive and very helpful for leaky gut recovery. Another formulation that I have is, is um, 
is called GI Soothe, and it contains a number of different herbals, botanicals, and nutrients that help to um, line the stomach or coat the GI tract, but also to support nourish the cells of the GI tract. Again, that's called GI Soothe, and it's a blend of different, different items. Those two would be things you can use. I also have another product called LGS Support. LGS stands for leaky gut syndrome and LGS support is, is critical uh, for the inflammatory component. It has a lot of different botanicals that help support healthy inflammatory response in the GI tract if your gut's being, uh, if your gut's leaking as a result of inflammation. I got blood blisters. Juan says, I got blood blisters after, after consuming palm oil. Is palm oil bad for celiacs? No, not necessarily. Some people, I actually test people in my, in my practice for palm reactivity all the time. And, and I do find that uh, probably about one in 20 people actually are, are reacting to palm oil. So it's possible that one for you, it's just something you're personally reacting to and not necessarily that it's bad for people with celiac disease per se. Let's see, Teresa, Dr. Osborne, I def desperately need advice. I have ulcerative colitis, gluten sensitivity. I lost 100 pounds recently and have been very ill after developing a pelvic or organ prolapse. I'm not sure I understand the question there, but Teresa, I would encourage you, um, you know, to work with a professional. Um, you certainly can call, you know, you certainly can call Gluten-Free Society and we can, we can help guide you in that right direction. The other thing I would encourage you to do if you're not already is follow no grain, no pain. Phase two of the no grain, no pain diet. Uh, we've seen put people with severe ulcerative colitis problems, we've seen that diet by itself help them tremendously. So that's a place you can start immediately. There's no danger to that diet, um, but it could very well start, start pushing you in the right direction. Okay. Maria, two mo the two modules of today's uh, classes have been packed with great information. Thank you, she says. Thank you, Maria, for tuning in and watching. So glad you're finding value there. Um, Raj, many GF gluten-free manufacturers use quite a lot of tapioca, but which is claimed to be of high glycemic index. Yes, that's another problem. So when we're talking about grain-free substitutes, gluten-free substitutes, tapioca, cassava are very common. Um, commonly used because they have that elasticity that's similar to wheat, that you know the mouth feel, the tongue feel, and so again, those products are high glycemic. So if you're a diabetic, you know you're not doing yourself any favors by just replacing one for one, you know tapioca from what you used to eat and eat in wheat or in in any other of the other grains. So again, you've got to be careful about about some of those gluten-free substitute grains for more than one reason. I love that. Elizabeth Lutz, PhD, says, heel cracking. After one week off wheat and most grain, my heel cracking disappeared. Love that. I love the, any of you have a story that you want to share and pump that into the feed. I love that because there are people here watching and tuning in tonight that, um, that are struggling still. They haven't had the, the time in diet, right? They haven't had the time on the no grain, no pain protocol to really see these things in there. Maybe one, they're either a little bit skeptical or two, just a little bit scared because they don't know what to do. And so these stories of, of, of overcoming illness is just fantastic for them to, to be able to, to see other people are doing it too. Let's see, Marina wants to know, is there an acceptable gluten-free pasta? There are, there are a few. Um, where you have to be careful with pasta is you've got to be super careful with the fact that some of these pastas are bean-based pastas or legume-based pastas. Let's get that out of the way. So, so caution around legume or bean-based pastas because you've got, you know, for example, there's chickpea and lentil. There's lentils, um, lentil pastas. There's mung bean is another example of a pasta. And look, these are... If you've got a really healthy gut and you're not struggling from years of gluten-induced gastrointestinal inflammation, um, a lot of people will tolerate these okay. But if you're new, if you're kind of a gluten newbie and you're struggling with that gut inflammation, these are things that I don't recommend 
trying to sub in, at least not at first. Get through six months of, of healing and repairing before you make any attempt at these. The other thing, uh, a couple of others, there's a kelp noodle, which is pretty good. So it's a, it's a pasta, it's a cereal, or not a cereal, but a spaghetti substitute, a kelp made out of uh, kelp seaweed as an option. Um, that, this is one that you can try immediately, right? So if you're looking for an option that's not a bean or a lentil base, but kelp noodle can be one of those. There's also uh, pasta made from glucomannan or sweet potato noodle uh, as a potential option as well. Now, what some people do is they get a vegetable spiralizer. Um, so it's a, you can find these you know, in a cooking store, a spiralizer, and so they, they put in their zucchini or they'll put in, typically it's with like zucchini and they'll spiralize the zucchini into long noodle shapes. And that can be something, again, that might be an option for you as well. Another one is spaghetti squash. Um, spaghetti is one that, that, or spaghetti squash rather, is another one that a lot of people use as a substitute. Again, it's not going to have that same mouthfeel or texture, but... It is a good option and a healthy option, very rich in beta carotene and vitamin A. Um, so a lot of good nutrients in that, in that type of food. Uh, let's see, scroll on, scroll down on the right for me and on the left too. Okay, right there, yeah. And then down on the right. What you guys can't see, you know, every time you watch me, I'm, I'm talking to somebody saying scroll. That's my, my producer, Mel, um, who does a great job for us, by the way. And he's just showing me the questions so that I can read them and, and feed them back to you. So here we go. So what if financial poverty is preventing me from being able to get help and I am now so sick I cannot find any doctors that know about the leaky gut? The, the one free thing that you can do, Cherie, is go to the library and get a copy of No Grain, No Pain. Look, the book is published in multiple languages. It's at pretty much most major metropolitan libraries. Um, get a copy and start following it. That's free. It doesn't cost you anything other than the time to read it and start applying it. That, that part's free. Um, because if you're in, in, a, in a financial situation, your health is your wealth, right? And your wealth is your health. And, and so you've got to start taking action. So one of the quickest actions you can take is start applying sound diet principles. Sound diet principles, good sleep, clean air, clean water, sunshine are essential to good health. And all those things are relatively free. You might have to pay for your water service, but um, the rest of that is, is for the most part free. And that's where you start. You start there first and get some of your health back. Let's see. Weed allergy versus gluten sensitivity. So I can tell you didn't watch the class today. So go over and register because that's a huge question. Um, I spend about an hour answering that question um, and register glutenfreesociety.org forward slash masterclass. Watch module one. It breaks down the differences. I'm also going to be breaking more of those nuanced differences down in later modules as the week goes on. Um, thoughts on marshmallow root and slippery elm? Well, I was talking earlier about a product to help with the GI tract with leaky gut, and those are two of the ingredients in my product, GI Soothe. So I, I like them both. Um, Lily, what do you recommend for IBS? I got GI Restore and Gluten Shield and Immune Shield from you. Any other suggestions? Well, if you're talking about IBS, the, the, the Claire or, or, or IBS can mean inflammatory bowel um, or it can mean irritable bowel syndrome, right? And an irritable bowel is not the same thing. So if you're talking about irritable bowel, um, one of the things that's really important for somebody with irritable bowel, in my experience, is a good probiotic is getting on a good probiotic. So I have, a, I have several different probiotics. We've got gluten, uh, gluten Shield has a small amount of probiotic. It's more designed to help with gluten recovery. But if you're looking for really strong probiotic, we've got ultrabiotic defense, we've got regular strength biotic defense, we've got biotic defense with S. Velarde, and we've got something called biotic force. Those are our main probiotics that, that we have in our, in our store. 
And any one of those would potentially be a good option. And, and where I would say the difference would be is it one is dosing, is, is strength. The ultrabiotic defense is our highest strength product. And if you don't have inflammatory bowel issues, that's probably not one you need to worry about. Or if you haven't taken an antibiotic recently, that's probably not one you need to worry about. So then it, the big difference is between biotic defense and biotic force. And the biggest difference is biotic force is a spore-based probiotic. If you struggle taking regular probiotics, most people who struggle, they get gas, bloating, intestinal discomfort on probiotics, do better with biotic force because it's a spore-based or spore-form probiotic. And it's, so it doesn't have the prebiotic and the other things that can cause gas and bloating in the intestine. So hopefully that helps you give a good start. Um, if you're as so somebody's asking about a COVID vaccine and wheat allergy, there's as far as I know, there's no wheat um, per se in the COVID vaccines, but um, but that's something you, you there are different vaccines at this point, and there are also many more in development. So if you're at all considering that, you know, first of all, I would I would ask you to get really good, solid, informed consent about these vaccines because they're all experimental at this point and it's not really something that I would say you would want to be part of a guinea pig experiment about. Um, that being said, you've got to make your own choice. But um, these these vaccines, again, they're, they're, they're not approved. The, the media has been telling you they're approved and that they're safe and that they're effective. And that's really not true. None of them have been approved. They've been approved for what's called emergency use authorization, which is not the same thing as, been, as being approved, as in going through multiple clinical trials and going through uh, placebo arms in those trials where there's also long-term safety data that shows that there's no great risk of your future, you know, a year from now or two years from now or three years from now. Remember, the, oh, they're all very brand new. Anytime there's new medicine, on the market, unless you're desperate, unless you're in a life-threatening situation, you know, my generalized advice, you know, if I'm if I'm looking at it in terms of if it's me, if I'm if I'm considering a medicine, not that I not that I necessarily would, but if I were, I would say that medicine needs to have at least five to ten years of safety data and a track record before I would contemplate putting it into my own personal body. But you know, you've got to make your own decisions about those kinds of things. But again, as far as a wheat allergy is concerned, now, um, as far as I know, the, the vaccines do not contain wheat as an ingredient, at least not, not any of the labels I've looked at. Okay. Joanne wants to know, can gluten cause low platelet count? Yes, it can. And we are, uh, actually, we talked about that today a little bit. I actually mentioned that thrombocytopenia is the name of that condition that we know gluten can contribute to. And there are a number of mechanisms behind that. One of the big mechanisms is nutritional deficiency. Gluten causes damage to the GI tract leading to certain B vitamin deficits, particularly B12 and folate. Those two nutrient deficiencies can cause low platelets uh, to develop over time. So, so that's important to understand. But again, that was covered in the class today as well. Uh, let's see, word girl, my stomach hurts 15 minutes after I eat, then goes away. What is that and what should I supplement with to remedy it? Word girl, I would say you may be reactive to some other foods that you're consuming. Get tested. Um, we're actually working on a test that people can do without their doctor. Uh, something I've got hopefully coming uh, to Gluten-Free Society in the next year. Uh, but in the meantime, it's really important if you suspect there could be some other food sensitivities or things beyond the grains that you're reacting to that could be causing that symptom. It could also be that you have some kind of damage that's going on in your GI tract or in your stomach so that the very act of eating itself creates an irritation or a pain. Um, it could be that you have a gallbladder problem or a liver problem. It could be that you have a low stomach acid. I mean, there are a number of different potentials. So I can't, it's, it's hard for me to just give you exactly, okay, do this or do that. I would say know those different things and kind of walk through and try to rule them out one at a time and see if, if that doesn't help you. Uh, as far as supplements or vitamins for somebody with a wheat allergy, it's again, taking supplements is not going to fix a wheat allergy. Going wheat free is going to help with that wheat allergy more than anything else. But from a supplement perspective, um, I think we talk about that in module seven. 
of the of the glutenology master class it is it's actually it's module seven so make sure that's that's going to be on day four um, where we talk where we go through that information but in that module i talk about the top four supplements that everyone with a gluten or wheat or or food sensitivity issue should be concerned about taking uh, on a regular basis to support their good health so again i'm going to encourage you to sign up for that class What about buckwheat? Estelle wants to know. Estelle, did you watch module one today? I'm going to refer you back to module one on buckwheat uh, we, because we discussed that. We did discuss that. I'll, I'll just tell you that buckwheat's problem, this biggest problem is cross-contamination and gluten mimicry. Those are two of the big issues. It technically is not a grain, but those are two big issues with buckwheat. Is organic LOP protein okay or is it hard to digest? Both. Um, depends on the person. It can be a little more challenging for some people to digest, especially those struggling with persistent GI symptoms. But uh, for some, it's, it's perfectly fine. Actually, we use a, a version of organic pea for our vegetarian clientele um, who are trying to um, avoid the beef and the other forms of, of, of animal-based proteins, provided, again, their guts uh, are not giving them problems. Okay, let's see here. Um, scroll on the, on the left-hand side. Scroll up so I can see the top part of that question. Oh, there it is. Okay, so Lorraine wants to, I've been eating gluten-free for seven years. I was instructed by a, uh, an FMP not to eat gluten. I arrived vomiting and broke uh, broke out with blisters all over my back. I was tested for HLA DQ2, and yes, I have it. Does this mean I'm celiac? I was never sent for testing. I was just told not to eat gluten. I need a diagnosis for insurance coverage. Um, you know, you can't diagnose celiac from a genetic test. Um, I go into detail about this tomorrow in the master class. We actually Tomorrow, most of the day's focus is on the pitfalls of testing and diagnostics around gluten sensitivity versus celiac disease. But you can't tell whether or not you are celiac from a, a genetic test by itself. The, there are gold standards for, di for insurance purposes for diagnosing celiac disease. And the, and the gold standard that's used in medicine is an intestinal biopsy. Um, and and, and the problem, there's a lot of problems with biopsies. They can yield a lot of false negative test results. So even those are not a guarantee that you'll get the diagnosis medically that you're looking to try to get. So, um, you know, under, understand that if you watch, Tracy, if you watch that class tomorrow, it'll make a lot better sense for you. Um, so I would encourage you, because it's about an hour, hour and a half long lecture um, that I give for that, so I don't have time to get into that tonight. So really want to encourage you to make sure you tune in tomorrow. So yeah, so Tracy's asking, I tested positive for HLA DQ2 and 8 as well as 1 and 3. Does this mean that I'm at risk for celiac disease? 2 and 8 give you greater risk for the development of celiac disease. Yes, that's what a 2 and an 8 confer. They confer a greater risk but they don't confirm that you have celiac. Um, again, I, so many of you are confused on this issue. I really want to emphasize tuning in tomorrow because that question is answered in, in great, great detail. And I spell it out. It's, it, there's just too much for me to go into that tonight. I apologize if I'm letting you down tonight, but tune in tomorrow for that because it really, the answer is, 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 I can't give it enough justice in this small time that we have tonight. Let's see, Carolina, grain-free diet and the amazing guidance of Dr. Osborne helped me overcome many ailments, arthritis, inflammation, hypothyroidism, lost 40 pounds, and I feel amazing. High five virtually, Carolina. Super happy to see you here in the room tonight. Great, great that you're sharing your story with so many people. Let's scroll down on the left and right. Uh, let's see. How bad can magnesium stearate or can it cause further health issues? No, um, there's no great research at all. There's, there's some people out on the internet right now that are really plastering 
uh, giving magnesium stearate a bad rap. Ma there's no, no harm in magnesium stearate. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. So if you're taking a supplement and that's one of the ingredients, that's not what you should be concerned with. There certainly are other ingredient fillers that you should be concerned with. That's just not one of them. Um, can you talk about what forms of vanilla are gluten-free? Is pure extract okay? That's a great question, Ricky. The, the best vanilla is the kind that you make. You can make your own vanilla, get your own long vanilla beans, put them in alcohol, and you can cure it as long or, or, or uh, soak it as long as you want and get a really strong, great vanilla flavor. But most of your commercial vanillas are going to be made from, or, or you're going to run the risk of them being made from a distilled spirit that contains or that is a grain base. And that's, that's what I look at as the potential uh, area for it being problematic. So um, we actually make our own at home if we want to get vanilla. Let's scroll down more on the left. Um, let's see, Mary, I seem to be allergic to the tomatoes and spaghetti sauce. Could the acid be causing the allergy? Well, so allergy is a big word and it, and, and it doesn't mean what most people think it means. Uh, it's kind of like the Princess Bride. Those of you may be fans of that movie where he says, you know, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. This is what allergy is like. People think that allergy is this catch-all term. Um, Allergy is very, very uniquely defined. To be allergic to something means you would have a true acute response. Your lips would swell, your throat would constrict, you would break out in hives, your heart rate would go up. Um, you know, you might have severe acute problems immediately. That's what a true allergy is. A sensitivity, on the other hand, is more of a kind of a delayed response where you react to it. And then there's intolerance, which is when you eat a food and your, your gut doesn't tolerate that food very well for whatever various reasons. Maybe you don't digest it or maybe... Uh, maybe you just have a, a, an eroded GI lining, as in the case of tomatoes, uh, depending on how you're taking them in, can, can be an acidic food if the lining of your stomach or the lining of your GI tract is compromised from pre-existing inflammation or damage. So it's possible, yes, it is possible to be allergic to, to the tomatoes in the sauce, and you know you can certainly cut it out, and if you feel better, you'll, you'll at the very least know that avoiding it makes you feel better, whether or not you're allergic versus being sensitive or intolerant or maybe different issues. You know, I'm quibbling with definitions here, but, um, but to me it's important to know the difference because knowing the difference means you know how to get properly tested and get a proper answer because some allergies are permanent and some are not. And so we don't want people to restrict their diets permanently forever if it's not necessary. Does intermittent fasting or extended fasting help aid in recovery from gluten toxicity? Absolutely it does. One of the best things that you can do in your gluten recovery is daily intermittent fasting, at least a 16 hour window of fasting followed by an eight hour window of eating. Um, but additionally, you can go longer. Um, remember that intermittent fasting is not calorie restriction. It's just time frame eating restriction. So you're eating just as many calories just in a shorter time frame throughout your day. Um, let's see, are all the modules available all week? No, tomorrow you'll get modules two and three, or three, or sorry, modules three and four. On Wednesday, you'll get modules five and six, et cetera. So it's two new modules every 24 hours is, is what you'll have available to view during this week's viewing period. Um, Helena asks, will there be a Q&A session at the end of the Masterclass series? Yes, there will be. Um, at the very end of the series, I will put together a Q&A session for you guys just because I wanna make sure that you're dialed in and you're, you've got it down and you know what to do. Um, so yes, there will be. Is it good to drink decaf from grinds or instant or not? Um, Lorraine, I want you to pay close attention to module eight on Thursday um, where I get into gluten mimicry and coffee and in in caffeinated and decaffeinated and all that. We go into kind of a deep dive on that topic. Is if one cannot have access to proper testing, is an elimination diet a good way to pinpoint intolerances? It, it's a good way to start. What an, what an elimination diet does is it really helps you differentiate what your body is bothered by most immediately. So more specifically, that would be acute or subacute food allergy or intolerance, a food that might cause gas, bloating, indigestion, that kind of thing. Where a food uh, elimination diet is not is going to fail you is if you have delayed hypersensitivity responses. The window 
of inflammatory reaction for a delayed sensitivity is up to three weeks long. So an elimination diet, it's really hard to pinpoint, excuse me, through an elimination diet to get accurate representation of what else you might be, you might need to avoid. I've seen cases where people were doing everything perfectly right, you know, from their diet perspective, but they didn't have the right testing. So they were some of their favorite foods. They were still having this inflammatory response to, it's just that it wasn't an acute response. They didn't detect it right away. It's just, they had low levels of inflammation all the time that never fully went away. Um, tomatoes are a nightshade vegetable. So may, oh, let's see. That's not a question. That's somebody's comment to someone else. Um, can gluten sensitivity, celiac cause omega-3 fatty acid or essential fatty acid deficiency? Yes, of course, Lauren, that's a great question. Gluten sensitivity to celiac disease can definitely, it's actually one of the top nutritional deficiencies that I see in people with gluten sensitivity when we test them. So definitely can. And, and so symptoms of omega-3 fatty acid deficiency, dry skin, uh, some develop eczema-like skin rashes or skin lesions, uh, but we also see the hair will get really dry. We'll see heightened levels of inflammation. People, when we measure their blood work, we'll see elevations in C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Many people with omega-3 deficiencies have increased pain. Joint pain and muscle pain are not uncommon to see those things as well. And in babies, um, we see poor development, poor neurological development. In adults, we see more like cognitive decline, brain fog, fatigue, uh, trouble recalling words. These are all things that can set in with omega-3 fatty acid deficits. Can gluten recovery cause pepper intolerance? It's not that gluten recovery causes pepper intolerance. intolerance. It's that a person can be intolerant to peppers. Um, if you eliminated gluten, you probably changed your norm. You probably felt so much better. And then when you, when, well, it's not, gluten elimination doesn't cause you to become intolerant to other foods. I'll just put it like that. Um, if you started to react to peppers after you went gluten-free, it's not because you went gluten-free. It's probably for, for some other reason. Um, are hair samples for food sensitivity tests? So how accurate are hair samples for food sensitivity tests? They're not worth the paper that they're printed on. I wouldn't purchase them. They're garbage. It's junk science. Hair cannot detect food sensitivities. Uh, it's, it's garbage. Don't buy it. Don't waste your money. What about SIBO with constipation? What about it? Um, if you're asking me if gluten can contribute to SIBO constipation, the answer is absolutely yes, it can. Um, but specify more deeply what your question is and I might be able to get you a better answer. Uh, let's see here. You said most coffee is contaminated with mold or mycotoxins. Why is that? Is it due to the manufacturers not storing the coffee? Yeah, it's part of it is, part, is how they store it. Um, how do you get coffee without the mold or mycotoxins? Well, you, you get with companies who actually uh, take greater care of where they source their beans and actually do testing on their coffee. Again, going back to gluten-free society, I mentioned earlier, if you go back to the, again, to the shop uh, and then go to the food lifestyle section, those, those two brands, they actually do mold and mycotoxin testing on their finished products. So that's one of the reasons why I like to recommend them because they're, one, they're good products, they taste good, but two, uh, they're safe. Right, they're safe and they're not going to put you with your gluten sensitivity health history, or if you, again, if you're chronically inflamed, et cetera, it's not gonna put you at greater risk for creating more problems. Any recommendations for a multivitamin has the methylated B vitamins? <laughs> of course, Candace, I have actually two different multivitamins, um, but you're asking me whether or not, it, uh, trying to find a multivitamin without niacin or niacinamide, no, you're not gonna find a multivitamin that doesn't have um, niacin or niacinamide um, because any doctor or any company that's trying to formulate a solid multivitamin is going to use one of those two because niacin, vitamin B3, is one of the most common deficiencies associated with gluten, chronic gluten exposure. Um, so, you know, niacin is going to be part of the B complex and most of your multivitamins are, are not going to have only some of the B complex in them. Um, that makes it a bad formula, actually. Let's see. Freddie asks, um, 
you know, it's relevant to the to the time framing. Am I am I am I still anti vaccine? I'm, I've never been anti vaccine, Freddie. Um, I'm pro choice, but I'm pro informed consent. What I'm against is people not. I'm I'm against doctors not informing their patients about the potential detrimental side effects of an experimental. Um, vaccine that hasn't been long-term safety data tested. I think it's irresponsible. That's my opinion. But that doesn't make me anti-vaccine or, or, a, or a vaccine hater. That just means I'm pro-choice, pro-informed consent. If you want to get a vaccine based on all the information that you want to conglomerate um, and, and you're comfortable with that, that's your choice. You're, you have sovereignty over your own medical decisions. That's what I believe in. I don't, I don't believe that I should make the choice for you or that anyone else should, but I believe you should have all the information before uh, you can make an intelligent choice. And I think what happens to most people is their doctors fail to give them informed consent. And we've seen that over and over again. I think one of the other issues we face is many of the vaccine manufacturers are crooks, they're criminals. Um, they've been indicted and convicted of criminals or of crime uh, against humanity for many of the products that they sell, many of the products that they market, and many of them have, have been indicted and, and, and again convicted of, of their research practices. They hide information or lie about information. And I just think that, that you know, when there's a lack of trust, in my opinion, I, you know, you're not going to hire somebody that just stole from you to come in and, and, uh, and work for you or clean your house for you. If they've already stolen from you, you're not going to hire them again to come in unless you just, you know, um, you're just asking for trouble. Anyway, hopefully that clarifies that for you. Is oxalate an issue or cause with gluten and other intolerances and sensitivity? It can be. And one of the best things to do to measure whether or not you have a problem with oxalate is to measure your 24-hour urine oxalate excretion. Uh, and if it comes back elevated, then you might consider moving more toward a lower oxalate diet for a time. Uh, many of you have a history of kidney stones, and that, that's, most stones are formed from oxalate, calcium oxalate. And so if you have that history, again, get your urinary 24-hour oxalate test done. You can do that through any, any doctor. Any doctor can order that. And if your levels are high, you might just consider for a time a low oxalate diet to see if that helps you. Uh, let's see. Any opinion on redundant colon loops and gluten? Yeah, I've, I've actually seen... Uh, that be the case with people with gluten sensitivity. So I, I've seen that be the case. That's not to say that all people with that issue have a gluten problem, but I've actually seen that be the case. Yeah, Pixie Lord, uh, you help me in a lot of things. Thanks. Sometimes maybe too much information getting lost in all this. That's why you work with somebody. This is, look, guys, I've been spending the last 25 years of my life in study and in clinical practice. And uh, it doesn't come easy. Um, I may, I may make it look easy, um, but it, it didn't come easy. It, it's years and years of study and experience. It, it isn't a do-it-yourself project. If you're struggling and you're still not quite getting where you need to get with your health, look, don't treat this like, you know, like a do-it-yourself backyard project. You want to get help. Get with a good functional practitioner uh, who, who can navigate the ropes and help you kind of basically help you push through the learning curve because um, you, I've seen people come to me that have struggled for decades and, and they're finally finding me or they're finally finding someone like me who, who can actually guide them and help them a little bit more specifically. And that's really, if you're still struggling, that's what you want to do. Um, Okay, so I purchased Liquid D3 from, from you, but I'm not sure if I'm understanding the recommended uh, dose to take. It says take one drop, but does that actually mean one drop or full? No, it does not. One drop. So, so one drop is 1,000 international units of vitamin D, if you're talking about Liquid D3 from, from, you know, from my product line. And that, that's going to be, you know, for most people, a safe amount of vitamin D to take is anywhere from four to 10 drops, not dropper fulls, but four to 10 drops a day. Now, if you're going to get up into above eight, nine, 10 drops a day, you really should ask your doctor to measure your 25 OHD levels to make sure they're not, you know, they're not climbing too high. That's a very potent vitamin D. It's pre-emulsified. It goes right into the, from your gut. Even if your gut is totally inflamed and broken, it still gets absorbed. It's, we make it that way on purpose because many people with, again, with gluten issues don't absorb nutrients very well. 
Uh, can someone have thyroid antibodies and still be thyroid with a normal TSH? Yes, um, that is possible. Uh, Peter wants to know, he's, he says he uses a no low starch diet to keep his ankylosing spondylitis in remission. Um, do you think that oxalates can have or cause issues with autoimmune condition as well? The yeah, oxalates can deposit into your joints and they can create or mimic autoimmune arthritis, much like ankylosing spondylitis. So yes, the oxalate can, again, get a 24-hour urine oxalate test before you make any diet changes and that way you'll get a feel for whether or not your levels are too high. And if they are, then you can adjust your diet. Um, let's see here. Eating keto, I have HLA DQ2 and suffering from alopecia. How can I regrow my hair? Depends on what kind of alopecia you have, Lorraine. If you've got a, an autoimmune alopecia, um, we have uh, case study after case study um, where women have been able to regrow their hair even after the steroid re injections and everything else. So what's key for that hair regrowth in my experience? Again, if it's an autoimmune alopecia, not a, there are lots of reasons a woman or a man can have hair loss, uh, protein malnourishment, calorie malnourishment, malabsorption or maldigestion of certain nutrients that are important for the growth of hair. The autoimmune process around it can also create um, damage to the hair production uh, itself. And so you can end up with kind of smooth patches of, of hair loss. All that being said, you've got to figure out why your hair loss is occurring. It's not some, for some people, it's just gluten and a gluten-free diet, voila, gives them a recovery. For others, it's multifactorial. So there are other, in, there are other things playing a role in that hair loss. And that's where working with a professional might give you the edge in terms of, of the right types of tests to see and to help you to determine if there's something else that is, um, is contributing to your hair loss. Um, Lorraine's asking about, she's grain-free, sugar-free, but her liver swells up when she eats. Okay, if that's happening, you need, to, you need to get with the doctor and you need to get it figured out. There's something you're eating or something in what you're eating that's contributing to an inflammatory response and that needs to be resolved and figured out. So you gotta work with somebody to figure that out. That's definitely not a do-it-yourself project. Okay, let's see here. Wish Tom and Lisa, wish we found you 20 years ago. Thank you for so much help and the ongoing education, priceless. You're welcome, Tom and Lisa. Good to see you on tonight. Uh, let's see, scroll down on the left for me. So, okay, I love this question. Melissa is asking, so why can you find oats and rice that say gluten-free? So as I, as I mentioned in the master class, the reason why you can find oats and rice that say gluten-free is the same reason why you can find corn and millet and sorghum and tuff that say gluten-free. It's because the way the definition uh, is laid out, you know, the legal definition of what you can call something gluten-free or not in the United States, okay, is not really technically gluten-free, it's gluten-free. So according to food labels, gluten is not gluten, it's gluten, alpha gluten to be specific. And so for a product to qualify to be labeled as gluten-free, it doesn't have to be truly gluten-free, it only has to be gluten-free. Gluten is found in wheat, barley, and rye, but it's not found in oats or rice. So by law, Again, this is your government at work. By law, they can call it gluten-free, even though technically glu gluten and gliadin are not the same thing. All forms of gliadin are types of gluten, but not all types of gluten are gliadin. So go back and rewatch that master class. Go back and watch module one, where I dive into that nuance a little bit more in depth and show you the research. And this is something we've challenged. We actually had somebody call us today who'd reached out to the uh, one of the celiac associations, and they asked the celiac association, is corn gluten-free, is rice gluten-free? And they said, yes, you can eat as much as you want of corn and rice. And we challenged that, and we've been challenging that. That's why I founded Gluten-Free Society. I can't tell you how many people have come to me over the years who'd already had a diagnosis of celiac disease, were eating all the corn and all the rice they wanted, and were still very sick, not finding recovery. 
And I laid that research out in the master class. There's viable scientific evidence in research that these other grains that also contain glutens, just different types of glutens, are very much problematic for people uh, when they're trying to go on their gluten-free diets and lead to persistent inflammation and persistent disease, persistent autoimmunity. So, you know, it's the definition. I, I would just encourage, and we've, you know, we've petitioned a number of research facilities. We've petitioned the U.S. government to look at this a little bit more closely, but we never hear back from anybody. And that's part, of, again, that's part of why my mission uh, was to was to found gluten-free society as a resource because the the supposed experts in this field many of them are quiet on this front they're silent they don't bring it up i think it's conflict of interest that's just my personal experience and opinion with it i think a lot of a lot of uh a lot of these celiac diagnostic facilities um some of their research is funded by some of these what are known as gluten-free food products or food companies that are you know selling you corn and rice based products and so I think in some sense, there's a, there's a conflict there, a little bit of a conflict of interest. I, I would like to see more of the celiac diagnostic facilities around the country really gravitate toward taking my master class and really look at that evidence, look at the research that I've presented so that they could make a better delineation as opposed to just this, everybody with celiac, it's perfectly safe and fine to eat oats, corn, rice, and all the other grains. When in fact we know, we know for a fact it's not perfectly fine and safe. We know that many people still continue to struggle. And as I laid out in, in research for you today, up to 92% of gluten-free diets fail to lead to inflammatory remission in the GI tract of celiac patients. And this is one of the reasons why. So um, I can't I can't vouch for the government and why they've chosen this as the definition other than that's just the standard of care. And look, the standard of care in medicine for a lot of things is bad. It's not great. It's mediocre. It's, it's um, you know, it leads to more problems than it solves. That does, you know, but it's still the standard. It's still in that, you know, standards are standards. Doesn't make them right. I love that um, people chiming in. Um, I have celiac eating corn and rice makes my nose run instantly case closed. I, thank you for chiming in because so many of you, I mean, as a matter of fact, how many of you uh, have either gluten sensitivity or celiac disease and found that you do better when you keep the corn, rice or oats or other grains that are traditionally labeled as gluten free out of your diet? Just pipe in. Yes. Grain free for me. If that's the case for you. Um, I had a night, let's see, scroll. I had a nice and flush with shortness of breath, which is why I was asking if there's a multivitamin without it. If you're taking a good, if you're like, if you're taking my multivitamin ultra nutrients, um, you're not going to have a nice and flush. The, the dose of niacin in that product is not high enough to really create a nice and flush. The other thing you can do to minimize the niacin response is to make sure you take that vitamin with food. Um, Food minimizes a niacin flush. It kind of slows down the absorption of the niacin. Look at all the yeses coming through the feed of those of you who had the diagnosis and had to and really had to change your diet away. I hope those of you listening that maybe have celiac disease that maybe were educated, you know, in the mainstream in the standard of care. Hopefully, you're looking at those comments and responses uh, and seeing the proof is in the pudding. The proverbial proof, so to speak, is right there in front of you. People that couldn't recover until they've discovered this information that I'm teaching you. Let's scroll down a little bit, um, a little bit lower on the left-hand side. Is it dangerous to have too much B12 in your blood test? No, nobody's ever died from B12 overdose. Truth, 12,000 people a year die from aspirin overdose. Nobody's ever died from B12 overdose. I'll repeat it. Nobody's ever died from having too much B12 in their serum. Can calcium citrate cause heartburn? Not typically, but that's not to say it couldn't. Um, but no, I've not seen that as a typical side effect for people. But what you have to weigh, Mary, uh, Mary Ellen, is you have to weigh whether it causes heartburn for you. And I would say if you're finding that you're supplementing with a version of calcium citrate, I would look for the fillers. Are there other fillers or other things in that calcium citrate that might be creating an irritation for you? Um, because typically people don't have heartburn with calcium citrate. Is it safe to ingest insoluble corn fiber in some processed foods? Not, not in my opinion, and not in the opinion of all these people in the feed that are typing in uh, the fact that, that they had to keep that stuff out of their diet to get help. So no, don't recommend it. 
Is it hard to be gluten-free if others in the house eat gluten? No, um, no and yes. I think it depends on who you are and your personality uh, and how tempted you are by food and whether or not you're a foodie. I do a deep dive on the psychology of going gluten-free with family, um, and we'll do that. Um, I think it's module five or six um, where I do that dive, so make sure you tune in on Wednesday for that information. So I keep getting these questions. What about you know fresh pasta that's handmade from Italy, only from organic right? Is that, so, is that okay to eat? No, um, rice has gluten in it. Rice has a form of gluten in it. Mary Ellen, I really encourage you to watch module one. I can tell you haven't watched it because of your line of questions that you're asking. So really do yourself a favor, glutenfreesociety.org forward slash masterclass. It's not too late. You've got until midnight tonight to watch module one. It's about an hour long. Take some time, invest some time in watching that. Um, and this line of questioning, I know if you watch it, I know this will answer your questions. You'll be really solid about the direction you need to take your diet. Um, was, let's see, was gluten-free for years, but kept occasionally going back to rice and sorghum. Problems would build, finally stopped, problems stopped. So there you go. Um, there you go. Thanks for sharing that because that comes on the heels of, of a rice-based question. Uh, my husband's asthma is gone since we went grain-free for over two years, Lily says. Love to hear that. Thanks for sharing that, Lily. Um, can ultra-biotin irritate dry skin? No. Um, I've not ever seen biotin irritate dry skin. Um, so it's probably something else that, that's causing that. I, you know, biotin, tip, biotin oftentimes referred to as the skin, hair, and nail vitamin typically doesn't irritate skin, but actually helps with skin irritation. So just the opposite. Does what we eat matter if animals are grain fed? Yes, it does, but not from a gluten perspective. Animals can eat gluten in the form of grain feed, right? So like your chickens predominantly are grain fed. They feed them corn and wheat and, all, and soy and you know, all kinds of, of different things. Um, but that doesn't mean that their meat contains gluten. Um, I actually go into a deeper dive, I think Wednesday on this very topic. The problem with animals that are grain fed is, the, is that it changes the constitution or not the constitution, it changes the constituency of their, of their muscle. So it, it turns the type of fat that would be in that animal into a predominantly an omega-6 fat. So it drives the omega-6, omega-3 fatty acid ratio and pushes it out of balance. So grain-fed animals are, are generally contain a type of fat that's more inflammatory or contributes more to the inflammation process. So if you're already inflamed, that's where those types of things can be problematic. Oh, I love this question, Lauren. Um, have you ever seen erythromelalgia? Uh, yes, I have. I actually, there's only, well, this was almost 15 years ago. There were only like 12 cases in the entire world. I, I actually had somebody come to see me for that very specific condition. We took her from walking no less than a few steps to walking about a half a mile before the blood would flow into her hands and feet and create an issue. So I'm very familiar with that condition, have seen it and have seen it improve with a gluten-free diet. Um, although it's such a rare problem that we can't make bold, big, bold claims that there's a ton of research. But in my experience, again, with a very rare disease, my experience with erythromyalgia um, and gluten is positive. So, um, you know, again, it won't hurt you to go gluten-free, but it very potentially could help you. Uh, my doctor's prescribing a Remedex for chemo. What can I do to prevent osteoporosis? Ask your doctor to check your nutritional status, Betty. Um, it's important, um, especially if you're going through chemo, uh, it's important to monitor your nutrition. This is where the bone loss is going to kick in is the damage that chemo can do um, and, and the damage that it does in many different ways, but one is to your nutritional status. So get a measure of your status first so that you can supplement accordingly to what your body's lacking and what it needs. Because bone is not just about calcium. It's about many minerals. It's about many vitamins, etc. Can thiamine deficiency cause edema in the legs? Yes, it can. Um, thiamine deficiency causes beriberi, a form of congestive heart failure that causes fluid to pull in the legs. 
Can air hunger symptoms come from eating gluten? Yes, it can. Um, air hunger is oftentimes a sign of anemia, Lola, and uh, gluten is a major contributor to anemia. Are fermented foods and kefir ever fermented? Uh, from kefir from raw milk can be, uh, but there's a process to that, and that's why when you when you read no grain, no pain, you you hear me re say remove dairy and grain, not just not just grain, and there's a specific reason. I'll talk more about dairy later this week in the master class. I've heard that zinulin protein is glu and gluten contributes to leaky gut and that uh, leading to psoriasis. Am I correct? Ro Roger's asking. Yes, Roger, you are absolutely correct. Leaky gut, leaky skin. Um, beriberi seems to be underdiagnosed. Yes, it is. It's very underdiagnosed. Um, beriberi is very common, especially any of those of you with a history of gluten sensitivity. Uh, vitamin B1 deficiency is very common, but also any of you taking blood pressure lowering medications. Beriberi is one of the side effects, unfortunately, of certain diuretics and blood pressure lowering medications. And unfortunately, beriberi causes high blood pressure. So the very medicine used to treat high blood pressure can actually lead to B1 deficiency beriberi that causes high blood pressure and increases your risk for heart disease. It's kind of ironic, but that's that's the reality. That's the standard of care, right? The standard of care. Doctors don't train in nutrition, so they're not aware. Most of them aren't aware of the nutritional side effects of the drugs they prescribe. Okay, let's see. We run it. Actually, we're, we're out of time, folks. The questions just keep piling up. Um, we got to wrap this up. Maybe I'll take one more. Alex, can celiac disease cause tinnitus? Simple answer, Alex, is yes. But it's not the only thing that can cause tinnitus. Um, gluten can certainly damage the, the nerves. It's a known neurotoxin. Uh, you, you researchers in the UK have been studying this for years. Gluten as a neurotoxin can damage the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is the cranial nerve that feeds the ear, leading to tinnitus and vertigo imbalance. But we also know that gluten causes malabsorption problems, um, particularly uh, certain B vitamins, B12 folate deficiency, which are linked to neuropathy. Uh, and tinnitus is a form of neuropathy. And I have seen tinnitus in some cases reverse when people were B12 deficient and corrected their B12 deficiency. So um, yes, to answer your question, simply celiac disease can cause tinnitus. Okay. Thank you so much for spending Monday evening with me and, and for taking the master class. Those of you who are tuning in and haven't yet signed up for the master class, again, we'll put that link in the feed. For those of you who need to get registered, it's still going on. It'll be going on all week long. It's free to you. It's free to register. It's 14 hours of content and information that might just save your life. If you know somebody who struggles, you suspect might have a gluten issue, or if you suspect is, is autoimmune or you know has an autoimmune problem, this masterclass, I'm not kidding, could save their life. Make sure you share it with them. That's part of our mission here is to save 100 million lives. And the only way we're going to do that, folks, is if you share. We're being censored. Our information is being censored on a weekly basis. It's, it's being suppressed. It's very, very hard to reach 100 million people when the powers that be are controlling how the information is shared. So the other way you can prevent that is you can go to glutenfreesociety.org and make sure you're on my email list. We have the largest dedicated gluten-free email newsletter in the world. Come and be part of our, our tribe and part of the solution. So you can go over to glutenfreesociety.org and just type your name and email in. We'll send you a bunch of great free information to help you embark on your gluten-free journey. Thanks for spending again your Monday evening with me. We will see you soon. Uh, I'll be back for a live Q&A after the master class. So keep your eye open. I'm going to send an email reminder out for that. But until then, enjoy the rest of the master class this week. This is Dr. Osborne signing out. Have a great evening. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information. 
put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.